the slideshow um, and the audio of all our lectures. So no video. So any, I'll try to do all my board work up here. Um, so that will get captured as well. Um, but so anything you do say will be on the recording. I'm just posting, I post them to YouTube later and I'll post the link in Canvas. Um, but welcome to Ocam. Um, just uh, we'll go ahead and and start by doing regular syllabus day stuff. Um, class is a little bit different than Gen Chem, um, mostly, mostly because I will talk a little more about it. But really, I think OCHEM gets a bad rap um, because most people have heard that OCHEM is a really hard class. Um, and it's She's not. Just saying, no. <laughs> She's like, it's okay. It's, it is. It is very hard if you do a few. There are a few things that lend it, make it hard. Um, because typically this is the first class that people have come into where if you're strong at math, you can't just algebra your way through things. Um, and if you're really strong on the, on, I'll throw bio majors under the bus here. Bio majors tend to be really good at memorizing things. Um, you can't memorize your way through this class either. And this is probably one of the first classes that, that you've taken where that's true, where you can't just either map or memorize your way through stuff. You kind of have to understand some concepts and apply them. Um, and that's different for a, for a science class. And so, and the bulk of the people that take OCHEM are in pre-meds or chemical engineers. Chemical engineers like to map their way through things and the pre-meds like to memorize their way through things. So that's why it has such a reputation of being a really hard class. Um, once you understand that this whole first order is going to be about getting basic rules down, basic concepts, taking a few of the concepts from Gen Chem and sort of really digging in and applying and trying to get as deep and detailed as we can get using those couple of concepts. Um, my friend, when I was an undergrad who did his research was in OCHEM, he uh, would say that the answer to everything in OCHEM is electronegativity and electrons. <laughs> If you can understand what's going on with electronegativity and polarity and electrons, you can do well at OCHEM. There's some other variables in there that we'll add as well, but he's not wrong for the most part. Um, so it's a couple concepts applied really, really in depth um, and consistently. So we're going to spend some time. We're going to go slow this first quarter. Not it won't feel slow. We'll go slow as far as covering the volume material, but we're going to go in depth on these topics. And then in uh, the second and third quarter, we're going to start adding reactions and mechanisms like crazy because they're all going to start looking the same. So it's like, okay, here's another mechanism. This one is used as a carbonyl instead of an alcohol, but it's the same mechanism we saw last week. Um, so we're going to lay the groundwork to get those basic concepts down. And then we're going to start picking up speed. Uh, let's see. I set that mouse down. So let's do um, few basic housekeeping things. Um, I will make the recording available, as I mentioned. Uh, and let me go ahead and pull up the canvas shell so we can look at where that is. So, when, <clears throat> excuse me, I've got a little summer cold that I just can't shake the cough from. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so here's our, our, from the dashboard, when you click here, it'll bring you the homepage, um, which should look something like this, maybe not with the menu on the side, depending on how you clicked. And I guess for you, it'll look like that, minus the fuchsia color at the bottom. Um, so announcements will show up at the top. This should look familiar if you've had my classes before. Um, but these week one through 12, I just kind of keep everything in order chronologically. When I when I finish making the slides, which might not always be more than 10 or 15 minutes before class starts, but I'll upload a PDF of them here. Um, so you have access to the slides beforehand, at least a few minutes. And then when, when the lecture's over, um, when it finishes rendering, I have to download it from Zoom, upload on YouTube, um, and, the, and then I'll link it. So it takes a little bit, hour, two hours maybe, um, to get the recording available to you, but then you'll have access to these recordings. You just come back to week one, 
Tuesday, click on the lecture recording link that'll be here and it'll take you to the recording of the class. Um, and from the homepage, the rest of these buttons are, are grayed out right now. Um, I think they're still published. So you can click to them if you want, but it won't necessarily. Oh, no, I did have some other stuff. So apparently I need to go uh, adjust some things anyway, but it's not week two anyway, so it doesn't matter. So, um, but this is where most things are gonna be. At the very least, these week one, week two links are going to have the lecture PDFs and videos, and then usually I'll put a link to the labs we're doing for that week in there as well. Um, so everything you, will be there, and then I'll, I'll use Canvas for pretty much all of my communicating as well. So make sure the announcements on Canvas are unblocked or are going to an email that you check. Um, because if I make an, you know, if I make a mistake on an assignment or I need to move a due date or cancel class or something like that, I just make an assign announcement on Canvas, which should push a notification to your phone if you have the Canvas app or send an email to whatever email you have a link to Canvas. Um, but if you ever get somewhere for OCHEM and nobody's there and we're supposed to be there, um, make sure you check Canvas because it's possible I put an announcement out and you just missed it. Um, I try to give enough notice on those things, but uh, I do have three children, some small, some not so small these days. Um, and so life is rather unpredictable. So if I'm home with a sick kid, I probably won't have much notice myself either. Um, so I highly recommend using those Canvas apps and turning on the notifications. I won't spam you. Um, and you can adjust with preferences and stuff on that too. Just get a moment to hit. Um, because I think otherwise it'll, it might push announcements if you just for like new grades, like when I grade an assignment or something like that. If you have the setting turned on, it'll, put, it'll give you an announcement for that. That might get kind of annoying. Um, but I think you can set it to just get the announcement notifications when something changes. Um, let's see. Um, there's a lot of ways to turn stuff in this PDF. This is a second year course, so I'm assuming most of you have figured out how to navigate most of the technology. But still, if you need help figuring out how you can turn stuff in with a class of six people, I'm not really that worried about it being in PDF when in Gen Chem and there's there's 35 people. The difference between getting a whole bunch of JPEGs turned in versus getting um, a PDF turned in doesn't is a really big difference when it comes to grading. Um, with six people, I'm not as worried about that. So I'm not going to be too picky. I still prefer PDFs. They tend to save better, be more legible, um, be easier to keep all your stuff together so that when you turn in an eight page assignment, it doesn't. It's not eight separate JPEGs because that's trying, you know, really annoying on my end because they're all randomly named and I'm trying to figure out is this page one or is this page three? Um, so again, PDFs are great, but I'm not going to be super picky. We shouldn't really need much of a calculator this year. The only math we really do, we'll do some stuff in Excel, um, but really it's a lot of uh, theoretical yield calculations and percent yield calculations is mo most of the math we'll do here. Um, and the nice thing about organic chemistry is that pretty much all of your stoichiometry is all going to be one to one. So it's really just molecular weight calculations. And then one mole of reactant produces one mole of product with a different molecular weight. So it's really straightforward theoretical yield math and percent yield math. Um, the couple times we will use Excel to do some data analysis, um, I'll show you some new tricks with Excel, but we're going to use Excel to do the hard math. Um, it turns out, so one of the more important things that we, let's see, remember how to use this thing. We'll, do, we'll use an instrument called a uh, gas chromatograph. My bad, let's go now. There we go. Um, and a gas chromatic app is just one example, but a lot of times you get these, these figures called spectrums out of this, or spectra, um, where you can just have something like intensity, signal intensity on the y-axis, and maybe time, if it's a GC on this axis. And we wind up putting in a mixture of things into this column, and then we have a detector that can register how many molecules basically are coming out the other side. 
And so it's basically if you started with a two component mixture and you put it into this GC, you get something that look like this. Over time, you get two different peaks and those two peaks correspond to two different chemicals. So this is a way to separate things. And then the, what's really cool is that the integral of this is proportional to the number of moles for this peak. And so you can get mole fraction from this if you can find the area under the curve and compare it to the, this area under the curve to the total area under the curve will give you mole fraction. But that's not a really easy integratable function um, using regular calc rules, right? So basically in this class, I'm gonna tell you what to do when the function's not pretty, and you can't use real calculus. We basically just use the rectangle rule, um, but scaled up. If your, if your time points, your X's are close enough, then DX is really close to zero, right? And if DX is really close to zero, you have really, really skinny rectangles to do rectangle rule. And you can basically just sum all those up to get the integral under the curve. So it's basically a way around it doing real calculus. We use calculus concepts and the fact that everything in science now can produce so much data and these data points are so close together. DX is really small, so why bother trying to do the tricky math when we can just do the easy way of doing it? And we use Excel to do that because we might have 10,000 data points for this. But that doesn't really matter because if you code, if you write that formula once, figure out the formula or the area of one of these tiny rectangles, just copy and paste, right? It doesn't matter how many data points you have. So we'll do some, some cool math stuff like that, but it's not gonna be like word problem math stuff. It's not gonna be conversion problems. Um, we might use some gas laws at some point, but probably just more in a, con in a conceptual way, um, less actually getting numbers out. All this to say is that while there are lots of good sci scientific calculators out there, Google, Wolfram Alpha, get a good app for your phone if you're, if you're going to be carrying your phone with you. Um, there's some really good calculator apps that I, they have a free version, but the pro version is like five bucks for a lifetime. And it's, and it looks a lot like putting in, typing stuff into a TI-83. So you can actually see what you've typed in and has all the, all the same buttons and everything. Um, find something that works for you, but it's not going to be super important for this class. Um, we, this will be the second year of using our OpenStax textbook for OCHEM. Um, it's kind of a cool story that um, one of McMurray, who wrote our the textbook for OpenStax for OCHEM, um, this is the 10th edition, and you may have noticed that OpenStax hasn't been around that long. Most of their textbooks are like first edition, second edition, maybe a third edition by this year. Um, McMurray actually has been one of the, the first edition of McMurray probably came out 40 years ago, um, but he retired recently um, and decided to take his textbook to OpenStax because he doesn't need the money. Um, and so and he, uh, he lost a son to cystic fibrosis. And so when his son died, so any, any donations in, in lieu of paying for a traditional textbook, he just says donate money to cystic fibrosis research. Um, so it's a really well polished textbook because it's the 10th edition and it's one of the original authors, one of the original big OCHEM texts um, that, that everybody across Almost everybody who teaches OCHEM uses one of about six textbooks, and McMurray was one of them. Um, so that automatically gives the OpenStax one a really high credibility. Um, and it's free as a PDF. If you want to print copy, it's, it's huge. It's like 1,300 pages. And it's like, I think it's 50 bucks, 60 bucks. You basically just pr pay printing costs. Um, and, and that's all it costs you. So if you want a, if you want a paper copy, if you like studying from paper, um, I have a paper copy in my office. You can always come visit, um, come check it out. Um, but they're really relatively cheap. You're over here now upstairs. I'm downstairs. I'm behind the bio lab. When we do lab later, I'll walk everybody over and make sure everybody knows where I am. Um, but uh, yeah, so if you don't, you don't have 60 bucks or don't want to don't want to bother it. <clears throat> no. No. 
I lost the finger, so I can't click the link. The link is linked in there, but it'll just take you to the OpenStax website where you can get the PDF version. Um, and I believe the PDF version is also uploaded onto our Canvas shell or just email me and I can give you a Dropbox link if you're having trouble getting it from OpenStax for whatever reason. Um, and for the most part, we're gonna, for the first half of the class, we're gonna follow the order in the textbook really closely. Chapters, the midterm is gonna be on chapters one through six in that order. Um, where I'm not crazy about McMurray is I think, I think the next couple of topics get reversed in terms of what makes sense to cover first. So the second half of this class will actually be chapters 10 and 11. And then the beginning of the next quarter, we'll go back and do seven, eight, nine. Um, just because I think it makes more sense the way that I teach this class and the way that I think about these concepts is probably gonna be the way that you think about these concepts because I'm teaching you. Um, and it makes more sense to go out of order. So there might be a couple of things, times we'll see some things where it'll reference something we haven't covered yet in that chapter, um, but I'll try and keep that to a minimum and it won't show up on the assignments or anything like that. So I'll try to make that seamless. That's more of a headache for me than you, hopefully. Um, let's see, uh, we do have a tutor who has taken, actually we have, Cody Simmons still around? Yeah, Cody's, Cody's still tutoring. Cody's still tutoring. Cody's taking every chemistry class we have here. Um, he's a really good resource for OCHEM. He'll be one of our chemistry tutors. And then Brad Peden as well. He's a math tutor in the library. Um, but he's Ty is also. Is Ty here? I think so. I think they're still tutoring. Okay. Um, I, yeah. So if, if Ty Belairs is around too, they've taken. Um, our, I think all three quarters of, of OCHEM as well. But either way, there's a couple of good tutors over there. Some of the long time tutors over in the library have taken OCHEM. Um, so you can definitely get some help over there. Um, and I think, again, this being a second year class, I don't want to make any assumptions, but hopefully everybody's figured out what office hours mean. Um, office hours means you're supposed to come to my office to ask questions, right? Um, I've had students in the past that are first gen college students in their first college class, and like, oh, office hours, that's when you like close your door and do paperwork in your office, right? No, it's the opposite. The door is open. I want you to come distract me from my paperwork because God, I hate paperwork. <laughs> um, so come to my office hours. If the class is small, you're going to spend a lot of time with each other, lots of you know, study groups, hanging out in the science commons, working on things, working on the lab write ups, that kind of thing. So use each other as resources too. Uh, and then, yeah, the, we have some great tutors um, that are really knowledgeable about OCHEM as well. It's going to be a dumb question. Are there other organic chemistry classes? Well, one and two, we do have the intro to organic class as well. It's designed uh, more for people going into allied health. If you're going into a, to be a dietitian or a nurse and you need two quarters of chemistry, then you take intro to Gen Chem, which is Chem 100, and then you follow up with Chem 118 that Carl teaches. That's a 12-week that's a quarter class that covers both the basics of OCHEM and the basics of biochem in 12 weeks. So it's a real fast, real basic level. Um, and then I, whether or not that's, uh, if you are interested in taking OCHEM, not from me, I'm not offended, I'm not everybody's cup of tea, um, they do offer it down at WNC as well, um, in Sierra College in Rockland and, and Foothill, or not Foothill, uh, Folsom College. That everybody has the same course. It's the same material. Order might be a little different. The assignments might be a little bit different, but it's a very, very uniform class across the board. Um, and then once you get through the first year of OCHEM, I think I took another two OCHEM classes after that as a chem major, um, unless you're a chemistry major then one year of OCHEM is about all, you know, all you need for any of the other um, disciplines. If you're a chemistry major, then there's advanced OCHEM and a couple of other OCHEM topics um, that you get into in upper division classes. I, I think I wound up taking something like six semesters of OCHEM um, by the time I got out of the undergrad. Five, five semesters of OCHEM. Yeah, <laughs> I, I will tell you, it was it was an experience. The first time I took all upper division classes, my third year in college, and I had I had multivariable calc, um, advanced OCHEM, 
upper division biochem and physical chemistry all in the same semester. I had 16 units of upper division science and math, and that was a rude awakening. <laughs> that was the first time I ever felt I had ever felt like, oh no, I really don't have time to do all the things that I need to do. It didn't help that my wife and I started dating that semester too. So I had other things on my mind. Um, and it's not easy to study for PCHEM when you're trying to plan dates. Just hard to stay focused on one thing or the other. At least for me. Um, anyway, gotten off topic a little bit. Um, there are there is a discussion board open on Canvas. Um, people don't typically use it in a class this small. Typically, people, if we have, want to have a discussion, we'll just talk to each other in person. Um, but if you're at home in the middle of the night and you come up against a problem you can't think of and you want to get it written out so you don't forget it for the morning, there is a, oh, just a general Q&A discussion board that you can use. Um, there are some really good stuff online, too, for OCHEM. Um, you know, Khan Academy in particular literally got its start in organic chemistry. Sal Khan was trying to tutor his niece from across the country in, when she was taking her OCHEM classes as a pre-med. Um, and so literally some of the best stuff that Khan Academy has is organic chemistry. Um, and so that, that's super valuable. There's also a really good website called Mastering Organic Chemistry um, that has a lot of good figures. I'll actually, there's a couple of lectures where I think that they do a better job than any of the textbooks I've seen. So I'll actually bring in some of their figures in the second quarter, especially um, for some of the topics. But so when you, if you Google random chem, you know, OCHEM topics, those are the number one things that you're going to show up as results are going to be Khan Academy videos and mastering organic chemistry. And they're both pretty solid. I was going to say that there are some sketchy ones too. They're, they're there are. Fucking nonsense. <laughs> there are. And you will see if you, if you start Googling some really specific OCHEM lab techniques or synthesis stuff. Um, you wind very quickly finding forums that are talking about ways to make to make meth or MDMA and stuff like that. <laughs> right. um, so anything you see from from a website called Science Madness, they know what they're talking about, but they're always talking about drugs. Um, so there, there is. I have I've used and cited some Science Madness forums when it came to writing our our lab manual because there are some. I would have never thought to do it that way. Trust the guys that are trying to make, you know, bathtub MDMA yeah. to come up with a good result there. Um, so you, you know, just, you know, caveat emptor when it comes to science madness, you know what you're getting into, but it can still be useful. Actually, oddly enough, Quora, there's some good answers I've found to questions when you Google stuff and come up with a Quora result. It's like the new or, uh, yeah, it's like a, it's like a question more. Like yeah. that, but it's like a little more filtered. Not sure. Yeah, um, yeah it's, it's it's weird. So there are some good science answers there, and then um, Stack Exchange for any subject is always pretty reputable. Um, and they don't have much for chemistry, but some of our questions that you might come up with might show up on the Physics Stack Exchange, um, and there's usually some pretty good knowledgeable knowledgeable people on there. Um, so you can trust those results to some extent. It's not total garbage anyway. Um, trust but verify, right? You know, Gen X and the boomers can say what they want about millennials and, and uh, Gen Z, but we're much better at trust but verify than, uh, than the older generations. All right, let's talk about the way this course is designed a little bit. Um, so this is also a common question people have why, how come some courses are only graded by exams? That's not this course, but I've been tempted in the past um, for a couple of reasons, mainly because all of those other assignments that go along with the exams um, are really good. It turns out exams correlate really, really well. Exam scores correlate really, really well to people who do optional homework assignments. And so if, is there really, so the, the thought for a really large, classes for if we had 300 people in here, I'm not sitting down to grade everybody's homework assignment every week, right? I'm going to say, here's the homework assignment to do it or don't, because all that really matters is what you can show me at the end of the class. Um, and since exam results typically correlate really strongly with performance on the scaffolding assignments, like homeworks and labs and things like that, 
it's tempting to be like, well, if all of that stuff is really just correlated with their performance on the exam, why not we why don't we just do the exam? That's less less stress for me as an instructor. There's only one assignment I have to grade. Um, downside is correlation is not perfect, right? You can have those people that really do understand the material, but really can't take tests very well. Um, and things like that. So uh, we're not going to do that here, but I, you know, when we're I'm really using that question as an example to get at the fact that nothing is random about the course design. When instructors sit down to design courses, every decision is, is intentional for one reason or another. Sometimes the decision is made because it's gonna be easier on the instructor. Sometimes the decision's made because we've seen that this works better in the past. Um, but just don't, yeah, I, I remember as a student feeling like, man, why is this, why would they do this to us? Why would they make us do this? This is so stupid. It has no purpose. This, this isn't the best way to learn things. Um, it, just trust that it's not a random decision. It was made for, for a purpose. And usually that purpose is to try and get y'all to understand things better um, and be able to retain the material better. So, and so this is just an example of just, okay, well, what am I actually thinking about when I'm making these decisions is, well, how do I actually come up with a way to test how well you know this stuff without discriminating, discriminating against people that can't take tests well? It's hard because there's really, it turns out there's not a great way because of the internet, because of the nature of group work, it's really hard to actually assess how well you know the material without a test, frankly. Um, and we're always looking for new ways to do that. I know, Jerry, you had, had Bruce's ungraded calculus class last year. Oh, yeah, I made a big deal about that, yeah. Ungraded? So, yeah. Um, so he had like a little system where there was like a sheet and it was different topics that you had to master. And he would, he would give you a little golden star if you went in and either did an assessment like in his office or just like a paper exam. And you had to get a certain amount of stars for each grade. So basically you could get a, st a star, a check or a zero, right? Or something like that, or was it just star or zero? You either get it, you don't. You either get it. And so basically you go in, you do this topic perfectly, you get a star for that topic. And there was like 20, 20 topics for the quarter. Or something like so that, like 18, something like that. So it's basically here's the 18 most important skills that you're supposed to learn this quarter, and you could check them off one at a time. But basically, just go in, you get as many tries as you want, yeah, basically, to try and do this. We did that in pre high school. I don't know if you know Mr. Smith, Smith. I don't know, I don't know about here, but my high school math department had these things that were kind of similar, where it was like you had four topics a week that you had to try and get perfect, and you got. And you had to get them perfect twice or something like that. There's a lot of approaches to what they call ungrading. The whole point of ungrading, it's not truly ungrading. It's trying to, to decide grades in a way that, that helps the most students. Um, and sometimes that means getting rid of the extra assignments so they can focus on these are the core topics. Um, the way I would see it in high school is you would just break it up if someone missed the test. It would make it available still for them, like during right. office hours to take it or a more convenient time. Right. It is like, you know, it's, if you're not interested in a topic at a certain time, you can skip it. I did that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, and it really is like, it kind of removes a lot of the stress of you only get one shot at the test. That is the whole point is it makes the tests less testy um, because you can come back and try it again later if you didn't hit it the first time. Right. Um, and, or you could get half of the test down and not and skip the back half and come back and do the back half next week, things like that. So we're always open to new ideas. I've toyed with doing that. What I've seen has the, the best approach for this class in general. Um, one, I'm less worried about grading in this class because there's only six of you. So that's a lot less of a mental barrier for my ADHD than you know sitting down and grading the same assignment 30 times in a row. Um, is really, really daunting to me personally. Um, so with six of you though, 
everybody in this class, you're going to, I'm going to be very up on grading for the most part because you're my productive procrastination. I don't want to grade my Gen Chem class. I'm going to go grade the OCHEM students instead because there's only six of them. Um, so I'm, it's less of an issue in this class. Um, we will have a fair bit of assignments. Um, it'll be structured more or less, <coughs> excuse me, um, more or less like my other classes. If you had my other classes where there's an assignments category, a quizzes category, and an exams category. Pretty evenly distributed. This class also has a lab final. Um, and the, the quizzes are not time pressure quizzes, not in-class quizzes, same way that I did it in Chem 103, um, where basically some point over the weekend, you'll have a, a um, four, four question assignment. I mean, I don't think, I don't, I never mean for those weekend quizzes to take that long. Usually they're maybe an hour tops. They only take like three minutes. Yeah, some of them, some of them are really quick. It's basically four quick questions. And the whole point of the quizzes is to make you think about chemistry in between the end of class on Thursday and the beginning of class on Tuesday. Because otherwise that's five days in a row where you might not think about OCHEM at all, which sounds like a nice vacation, but it also means that you're not going to remember on Tuesday what we covered on Thursday. Um, so the, the quizzes are just a way to make you think about chemistry outside of normal chemistry hours. And usually on they'll go live and be able to start taking them at 5 p.m. on Thursdays, and they're just due by midnight on Sunday. Um, so sometime in there, you have to sit down and take these quizzes. Um, and the, one of the quizzes is all, or one of the questions is always three points. Just ask me a question about chemistry, either stuff we've talked about or stuff that, um, that you're just interested in. Um, but yeah, and it's really, there's no time limit, open book, et cetera. It's just, it's called a quiz because that's what Canvas calls them, the way they're set up. But really, it's just a weekend homework assignment where I can control the time that you have to work on it a little bit to make you do it on Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. Um, and you know, one of the reasons for that is that um, there has been some really cool studies on the neuroscience of memory retention and learning retention that say that the the act of uh, learning something and then going away and doing something else and then coming back to it in the next 24 hours actually about doubles retention. Um, and even compared to you learn something and then immediately take the, take the quiz on it and then come back to it, you don't retain it as well as the fact, go think about something else and then come back and think about what you did a few hours ago sometime in the next 24 hours think about what we talked about on Thursday, and that actually really improves long-term retention, the act of recalling it to several hours later. So clock recording is right. I don't remember that part exactly. When they, they, they open up his eyes and make him watch what he's done to other people, and then he can't and then do he, that anymore because he sickens, it sickens him. So it's the same. Memory. It's similar. It's similar. That one they were using more Pavlovian things, where they also they also drugged him at the same time. They showed him what he did, and then gave him some drugs. And oh, that's really, really bad. Yeah. Um, but uh, <laughs> interesting thought experiment. Um, one of the best examples of Pavlovian conditioning is the fact that if I say. Pavlovian, what do you think of? Dogs. Dogs. That's a Pavlovian condition response. You hear Pavlov, you think dog. It's because I was taught as Pavlov's dog. Is right. <laughs> exactly. It's a really good built in example. I think we're all fans of dogs in here, so. Yeah. <laughs> no, okay. no, I like them. <laughs> um, this class, we, so with the quizzes, we don't do too much in the way of, of homework because usually the, the quizzes kind of take the place of homework, but there will be some weeks where rather than have a quiz, I'll just say this, this material lends itself to a couple pages of reaction practice or something like that. So there'll be some weeks where, okay, instead of doing the quiz, here's the homework assignment. Uh, am I, and I sometimes I'll still put those in the, in the quiz category, but generally speaking, those will go into assignments. Um, and so for this class, assignments is, are going to be big, mostly your lab assignments and those, those couple homework assignments. There'll be a homework assignment at the midterm and the, and the final that's just practice tests um, leading up to the tests. And then the tests go into the exam category. Usually what I do is there'll be a, is the 
the exams will be closed book in class, but the lab final will have some open book um, final exam component to it. It'll be a lab write. It'll be a lab write up, similar to one we've done earlier in the quarter. But it'll also have a couple of extra questions that are sort of like take home problems. Um, it won't be a straight take home test. Um, it'll be, but they'll be incorporated into that lab final portion. Um, let's see. Uh, we do have goggles. We still have community goggles in the in the brand new labs. It took to have fun in the brand new labs. That'll be fun. Um, I saw that there's new lab coats. They're just like is it new? Yeah. Oh, I can't wait. I and all the old ones got went through the dry cleaners. They do that every year though. Um, but yeah, so lab coats are all nice and clean. All of the goggles have been freshly washed. But if you want your own goggles, we're going to spend a lot of time in lab this year. Um, so I, it's not a bad idea to buy your own goggles that you like that you know don't have the rubber strap. They make some nice ones that have like a elastic cloth strap, things like that. But something that fits your face. Um, we'll do regular lab safety stuff in at the beginning of lab today too. We have you resign them safety contract, um, same as, as last year, get to know the lab a little bit today. Is there a specific model of goggles we should look for? They just sure. need to be rated for chemical resistance, um, and they have to touch your face. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> and which means you're kind of limited. They're all pretty un unpleasant, uncomfortable, but there are some where the silicone is a little bit nicer. Is the there other a tag on it anywhere that you could identify it, or do you just have to buy it as chemical resistant? Um, so usually, so UVEX like. is the brand that we use okay. most often. There are several other brands, but UVEX is pretty good. I think all of their stuff is chemical resistant. Um, it basically just not the ones, not stuff that's impact resistant. Safety goggles from like a wood shop or from construction. They're rated for impact resistance, but they're not rated for splash resistance, and they're not rated for chemical resistance. So some of the solvents we'll, we'll use would actually start dissolving them if you got them on those, um, which you don't necessarily want to add plastic dissolving to my skin around my eyes to whatever other chemical spills are happening. Um, something like that went down. So um, they have to be the silicone kind or plastic that is rated for chemicals that touches your face all the way around. If you wear glasses on a regular basis, it's not a bad idea to get some that fit over the glasses. They have models that are designed to be a little bit taller and a little bit deeper um, that, that fit over most glasses frames. Um, and we have some of those in the community goggles as well, but typically goggles aren't that expensive. The cheap ones, are about, um, that meet all the requirements are about 20 bucks on Amazon. I don't think we have them down in the bookstore anymore. Um, but you can get, if you wanted to buy your own, which again, we have community goggles, but if you want to buy your own on Am I just go on Amazon, start looking around, see what's got good ratings, see what looks comfortable and meets your needs. This might have something to do. I would be wary of going to hardware it's stores it's just for those. Yeah. Impact. Uh huh. And so that's what I see what you mean about asking if they have if there's a tag. It should say chemical resistant on them, but I don't usually see anything at hardware stores that meets the requirements. Some safety glasses have a tag that's like it rates how impact resistant they are. So that you might also have a chemical resistant tag on some of those. Yeah. Um, it's more. It's not really a tag. It's more of a printing of plastic, so you can't. Oh, okay. It's, it's more of like a serial number. Gotcha. So everybody knows. You can you can take a look if you're if you have any questions you can always if you if you got them brought them to me and I could look at them and say if they work or not and if they don't you can take them back or something like that if you don't want to go online um, or you know use the um, use the community ones they're all freshly cleaned and if you wanted to pick a pair out of the community goggles that you're going to use this year um, I mean, we'll set up a little bin for the OCHEM students that has all of your stuff specifically so you could just keep yours away from the rest of the um, the rest of the plebes that are in, in Gen Chem and Chem 100. Yes. Um, uh, so uh, don't worry attendance, so don't worry about that. All the recordings are available. If you're not going to be here, it's still polite to let me know, but I'm just going to say, cool, you know where the recordings are. Um, if you need an extension for some reason, on an assignment deadline, let me know, but I'm generally pretty lax when it comes to pretty, pretty gentle when it comes to late. Um, I usually take about one point for every lecture late that it is. 
um, and all my assignments are out of 10 points. So after a couple of weeks, you're at half credit and then it stays at half credit for the rest of the term, basically. Um, I really highly encourage you not to wait to the very end to turn in all your assignments because then they're all going to be half credit and then I'm trying to grade them frankly during finals week when I get um, seven assignments in a row from you from dating back to the second week of school. I get that that happens sometimes. I was that student sometimes. I highly recommend that you don't do that or if you start to fall behind on assignments, I would almost go reverse chronological order. Because rather than staying two and a half weeks behind and everything is half credit, turn in the most recent assignment that's only going to get docked a point. You can still get nine out of ten. Mathematically, that's the best. Like basically, like okay, I'm going to finish these assignments, but I'm going to take the five out of ten on them anyway. So it doesn't really matter when I get those. Get get caught up on the stuff that's most recent first. And then you'll, that has the other side effect, is if you can turn in the assignment that's most recently late, then you're closest to the material that we're still covering, right? So that means you're not going to be constantly two and a half weeks behind as far as understanding the material, too. Um, but so while I accept the late work, um, don't try not to rely on that. Try to stay on top of things, and it'll, it'll have a lot of benefits um, across the board. And then with a class this small, second year class, I don't think I need to talk about cheating too much. But basically, um, if, it's, if it's anything other than a regular homework assignment, um, I don't want to find it on Che. I see all the stuff on Che. I see people posting my questions on forums like that. I'm aware of most of these different forums, not just Che, um, and ways of going about getting one and one like AI is really bad in OCHEM right now, so I don't even bother with chat or anything like that um, because you're going to get a worse grade than if you just have asked it yourself. Um, but so you know, basically, where we draw the line is anytime you turn in something, you should understand what you're turning in. Where group work becomes cheating is when it's you're copying something down and you're not trying to understand what you're writing down. You're just turn writing it down to get it finished. Um, if you're working in a group and one of you figured out a problem, by all means, that person can show everybody else how to do that problem. But don't turn it in if you don't understand what was said and what you're doing. Right? Because and if it, I only had to do this a few times, but what will happen um, if it becomes clear that. You know, three of you turned in the same answer, and I can tell by looking at it that it's the same answer. Um, if I'm not sure whether or not you are just working in a group or somebody's just copying, then I'll just sit you down with a blank piece of paper and say, do that problem for me. Um, and if you're totally lost and have no idea where to even start, that means you shouldn't have turned it in as your work. Right? As long as you can understand what's done, though, then that's just working as a group. Right? And again, we're not going to have a lab find or a take home test. So it's less of an issue. That's the biggest place where I see this issue is when I, there's a take home test. Because somebody will figure it out and nobody else understands it, but I get the same answer three times in a row. Um, it's, yeah, when it's, it becomes really obvious. And I can usually guess based on knowing personalities who figured it out and who just copied. Um, and I really don't want to have to deal with any of that. So just don't make that. It's better to take the zero on part of the test um, than it is to get a zero on the whole thing, right? You're better off being taking the hit um, because I am pretty gentle when it comes to partial assignment or partial credit and things like that too. Um, so let's not end on that note though for our, our break um, because there's more fun stuff to talk about instead. I talked about memory and retention a little bit. Here's the other one that I always come back to. Neuroscience of learning, happy students learn better. Obviously, I can't control what's going on in your personal lives or how stressed you're getting about various things or watching the news too much or something like that. Um, I mean, have you seen reality lately? It's a shit show. Oh, it's not, it's <laughs> um, but what we're going to try to do in this class is for the most part, when we get here, we're going to try and, and sort of flip to a new mode, flip to chemistry mode, 
where we're focused on chemistry, even random chemistry applications, as I don't want to say as an escape, but basically it's there's been a lot of research in neuroscience as well that they show when you walk into a new room, your brain actually like sort of flips into a different mode, which is why if you've ever walked into a room and forgotten why you walked into that room, and then you go back to the other room and you remember, um, that's actually, that's not just a I'm getting old thing. Um, that's actually everybody thing because that's how our brains work. You walk into a new room or even a new part of the room um, and your brain flips to a different mode. And sometimes that clears the RAM a little bit and you wind up losing what you were trying to remember. Um, we can use that to our advantage though here, right? If when you come into this room, try to put out away everything that's going on outside that you don't want to think about, even if it's positive things like, hey, I'm here. This is the room where I do chemistry. And if you can do that, then you'll find that you actually retain the information a lot better because you're not sort of mixing it in with all these other things that are going on. And so we'll try to make it a fun, happy experience as much as we can in here. I know not everybody's as into chemistry as I am, and I, that's okay. Um, some of you might be by the time we're done. This is a fun class. <laughs> you know, if you ask me anyway. You know who the Mad Hatter is in Batman? You remind me so much. <laughs> 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 um, but so, and that's why we're going to continue doing um, sort of like the icebreaker beginning of class topics. Any random questions that somebody had on the quiz from last week um, about random, like, hey, is this why this happens? Or, hey, you mentioned this in class the other day. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Um, you get to put those as your random chemistry question at the end of the quiz if you want. Um, and it can also be things like, hey, I really didn't understand this. For this class in particular, um, that's a really good way for me to figure out if I'm going too fast or too slow. I, if the six people in this class, everybody writes on their their um, their quiz answer, my, your random chemistry questions, hey, what did you mean by that? I don't understand how you did that problem. If five out of six of you all say that, that means I'm going too fast. And then we'll go back and we'll, we'll talk about that topic in more detail the next Tuesday. If five out of six of you are asking me random chemistry questions about just everyday life, usually that means you're feeling pretty confident on the material and I can pick up the pace a little bit. So you use that also as a way to kind of say, hey, would you slow down and talk about this a little bit more? or I'm feeling pretty confident about this, talk about this random chemistry thing. It's a good way for you to sort of um, let me know if you think that, that we're going too fast or that you're starting to feel lost. Um, because odds are, if you're feeling that way, you're not the only feel one feeling that way. And that helps me understand because there'll be, there will be lectures, especially with only six of us, um, where it's dead silent in here. And sometimes that's really hard for me as a teacher to judge silence as because silence can mean this is really boring. Can we go faster? And silence can mean I have no idea what the fuck just happened. And those are literally the two extremes. And I can't really read silence that way. That's why those quiz questions are really important to let me know. Um, and you feel free, obviously, if you're really feeling that way, I don't know what just happened. Please, during lecture, you can ask, say that too, but I understand that's a little intimidating sometimes. So feel free to be lost for half the lecture and then ask a question on the weekend or come to office hours to get help. Um, and we'll spend some more time on it. Then last but not least, this isn't as important in this class as some of my other classes, because for the most part, none of you have any idea about whether, whether you're good at OCHEM or not, right? So nobody has any sort of, you know, fixed mindset when it comes to, I'm bad at this. OCHEM is totally new for most of you, right? So, um, but this really is a big deal in Gen Chem because I can't count the number of times people say, I'm just really not good at math or I'm really bad at computers. Um, we got to get rid of that because that just means you're not good at computers yet. It's a really big cliche, but there's a lot of research that shows physically or even mentally internally saying that yet on the end of one of those statements makes a really big difference in how much you can grow. You say, I'm bad at math. That's, that's a dead end. Now nothing changes. I'm not, I don't understand integrals yet 
actually keeps your mind in the mood to learn more, to be able to understand more and retain more. It's a really dumb, cliche thing to do, but internally and within our group, if I catch somebody saying, I'm not good at this, I'm going to say the yet for you. If you're not saying yet, right? It's the difference between fuck this and I'll come back to this later. Right, exactly. <laughs> And I also like to think it's it actually goes both ways too. Just because you're good at something now doesn't mean you'll always be good at it. Because what happens as soon as you stop practicing for a sport, you start getting rusty, right? So it goes both ways. So you want to keep practicing the stuff your your weak spots, but also keep doing the stuff that you enjoy doing, stuff that you want to keep doing for a long time, fun hobbies, stuff like that, sports you enjoy doing. Don't stop doing them because you're going to start losing it. Um, I really like. Neil Young has an album called Rust Never Sleeps, which is basically, if you're not getting better, you're getting worse, is the main concept there, right? Um, which, when you start to approach 40 years old, starts hitting a little bit different. Um, but beside, that's beside the point. We're going to keep working this up. We're going to put in the work. We're going to get good at some of these things. And if I hear I'm not good at, make sure you put that yet on the end. Last thing, and then we'll take our break. I always use this quote. Um, Robert Heinlein is a somewhat of a, a weird, problematic sci-fi author from the from the uh, '60s. Um, it's not really. He dabbled in, in fascism in some of his his, uh, his in particular in Starship Troopers. And there's some other stuff. He's very sort of war hawk during the Cold War in favor of authoritarianism. Um, but he also has a lot of like you know free love hippie dippy work too. Um, it turns out that's mostly because uh, who he was dating or sleeping with or married to at the time. If you read, so he was a, a close friend of Isaac Asimov and Isaac Asimov wrote a, a memoir where he basically was talked about his relationship with Heinlein. And it turns out that Heinlein was just a chameleon politically and idealistically. Whoever he was with at the time, he kind of adopted their political views. Um, which is why he has such a huge range of political views in his fiction, which makes for really interesting reading. You don't know what you're going to get when, when you uh, pick up one of his books. Uh, but one of the things I really liked in Starship Troopers is this idea that the best things in life are not free. The best things in life are purchased with things other than money. Best things in life are the things you have to sweat for. Those are the things that you will appreciate in life. It's not things that you can buy. It's not things that are just free and easily, freely distributed. If I just said everybody, to everybody, okay, well, at the end of the class, uh, everybody's going to get an A, even the person who really earned a C. That's not going to feel very good to anybody, right? The person with the C might appreciate getting an A, but they're really, they're not going to feel like they earned it. The people that got the A are not going to appreciate that somebody that put in less work got the same grade as them, right? And that's because of the feeling of having earned it, putting in the effort. This class is going to be effort. There's a lot of hard work involved on your side and on my side. I, I will put blood, sweat, and tears into this class, just like I expect you to put blood, sweat, and tears into this class. And as a result, it's going to be a really good class, and you're going to really learn a lot of stuff. And hopefully, you come out the other side feeling really strongly about your experience. Um, like I said, not everybody's going to care about OCHEM like I care about OCHEM, but at the same time, you should at least feel accomplished by the time you get to the end of this class. So let's take a quick break. As usual, after, after about an hour of our two-hour lecture, we'll take a 10-minute break, um, and then we'll start doing a little bit of review of quantum as it applies to molecules and covalent compounds when we get back. So let's come back a quarter after. The Starship Troopers thing. Yes. Was, was that related? Yes, the Starship Troopers and that book? I don't think so. Um, the guy who did the remake of Robocop um, okay. did a version of Starship Troopers as a movie back in the late 90s, early 2000s that was all satire um, that went over most people's heads. Most people, you know, just like Robocop did, right? Right. Um, it was very much a satire of the original ideas in, Star in Starship Troopers, the book, but it was very, if you know that going into it, you can tell he's totally like, um, 
totally making fun of of people that sign up to join the military with right. to join to join in a forever war, <laughs> um, because that's basically what Starship Troopers is. It's it's a it's almost like Warhammer. Um, when was that written? Really? The sixties, you said. The book was probably written in the late sixties. Okay. And yes, um, yes, got together in the seventies. So. It could it could be a reference too. Yeah. So, yeah. I just um, love that. So, I'll, have to, I'll have to check it out. It's, but it's it's definitely an interesting idea. That one of the central ideas of Starship Troopers, um, the book, is that the only people that are allowed to vote um, are people that voluntarily signed up for. Uh, government service, which means military. Okay. Um, and so, if you if you're not required, it's not compulsory service. You're only required to serve if you want to vote. If you're comfortable just letting other people vote and not having a vote, you don't have to join the military. So it's sort of a um, in between compulsory military service for everybody, like Israel, versus not having a draft and only having volunteers, but everybody gets a vote, like right. the U.S. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, so it's an interesting thought experiment. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, but you just wind up with the military controlling everything. Right? When you said the fascists end this whole thing with money, like I've always thought that money is the is the real power in our fascist society here in America, as, as far as everything's becoming capitalist and right. Really get anywhere with that money? We're reading, we're reaching that post that late stage capitalism. Yeah, um, to where the money is now, it's more fascist. Uh, Everything is controlled by money because that's what the right. power is. And this, and it's a little bit. This is just. Um, it, it wasn't. It actually doesn't talk about the economy in their system hardly at all um, in the book or anything like that. So it's, but it's more just that. Well, the only people that could vote are the veterans. Then it, you're only going to get people, or you're only going to get issues that veterans care about actually being addressed. Right. Um, Interesting. No it's, it is sense. interesting to think about, especially knowing some of his personal history and that this is sort of in his Warhawk phase. And it definitely applies today with like yeah. homeless vets all over the place. Like they right. would be they would be in that situation if they were the only one voting, I feel like. Correct. But I feel like a lot of people don't vote at the same time. So <laughs> <There's> a, yeah. <laughs> it's a double-edged sword. Of it is when it turns out that turns out that everything's complicated, right? Yeah. Um, and that's what a lot of sci-fi authors miss. Some of the best ones understand how complicated these issues are, but especially back in the 60s, um, in some of the early days of, of sci-fi, um, they, they tended to oversimplify and be a little over-idealistic about some of these concepts mm -hmm. um, without taking into account all of the other factors. Like, you know, there's no mention of PTSD or anything like that because it's before that was even a term. Right. And so that, well, that would be something that really would cause some issues, right? If we try to adopt a system like that, this, and then that would probably affects homelessness and vets. We always got problems, it seems like as humans. Like I spent all the way through history. Oh, yeah. We always got, <laughs> always got right. problems. Even yeah. Plato said democracy isn't working, right? <laughs> right, exactly. Like, Socrates, I forget you. Was it Plato? <laughs> probably Plato. I think he's the one, Plato's the one who wrote The Republic. Um, so probably Plato, but he also quoted so we don't actually have Socrates's writings, right? We just have Plato's Plato quoting Socrates. Um, so it's difficult to say where that idea came from, but either way, you see what those ideas. Mm -hmm. That was your summer. Were you working on boats? Uh, over the uh, keys, like last summer, not not recently. Yeah. When I was 19, I bought myself a sailboat and taught myself about to sail without a life jacket or lifeline or anything. Just took it out on the lake and figured it out. It was nice. It was fun. It was yeah. exciting. <laughs> exciting for sure. Yeah, I spent a lot of time on rescue boats, so that's sort of why I was comfortable just yeah hanging on the mast and yeah all that. But, uh, yeah, I can get ready to get, get a trailer for it, so it had to be sold. Over at the West Shore, though, there's a Tahoe Speedboat Company where they're, the guy there, he's a like, master mechanic, but his wife's sort of crazy. <laughs> so uh, that's where uh, getting employment is kind of hard. Yeah. Uh, we put in uh, Cobalt, who's a dual prop to 
1050s, right? So 2,100 horsepower in there. Wow. And it was, he, he was trying to test it out, right? It was a performance test of the mm. first day on the job. And he just took it up to max like speed. And I'm sitting sideways in the boat on like the, so I'm starting to like just shift just all like, the way to the back. <laughs> and he said he got it up to 170. Wow. Which is what he was trying to get it up to. And that's what the customer wanted. <laughs> the, the fastest I've ever been on, on the water, because my, my in-laws have some of you really high-end <laughs> um, jet skis. I'm trying to think what the, what the brand they are now, but they're, they're like, 200 horsepower jet skis. Nice. Now that they'll go, they'll go 85. Oh, um, that's smart. Like those are, those are a lot of fun. Like burn through the gas with that. Yeah, absolutely. At uh, Keys, we had the supercharge. It was the 250s, the supercharge 250s, and that was a 90. Yeah, and two people. Well, so he's also he's also doing this on a lake that's only that's the size of Emerald Bay. Oh, uh, it's just on a, like three miles long by one mile across lake <laughs> with, with a max depth of like thirty feet. So it's a gun it and then you try to right. stop. It. <laughs> it was fun to put the the trainer key on it this year in my ten year old drove and I rode on the back and he at the trainer key puts the governor at 40, okay. uh, which is still pretty quick on, yeah. on a jet ski. Too, yeah. and, for, and he definitely had full throttle, which is hard right. He was fine. He, I skipped a girl <laughs> on the back. Nice. <laughs> you know, you have to get him back in two years. <laughs> oh, wait a little bit. I don't want to, I don't want to hurt his ear drum or anything like that. <laughs> Uh, and he did that himself, mess around on the tube with, uh, with his grandpa anyway. So I didn't need to get involved. More like a year. Do you have a good summer, Ed? Yeah. Around here the whole time? You're a big climber, right? Yeah. Yeah. Do you have to do some good trips? Oh, yeah. I tried to do this thing. It's not so like years. Yeah. 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 Is Mount Whitney bigger than the highest mountain in Colorado, but Colorado is more 14ers? Is that right? Whitney is the highest one. It's really interesting thing about the U.S. It's like they all kind of like talk to each other. So there's like a bunch of things that are all Yeah. Whitney's 14. Almost 14. Almost 14. That we're probably right there. So I had to memorize a bunch of peak heights when I was in sixth grade, and some of them still crop up. 14, 494, I think. It's kind of funny now, like, every, yeah. you, like some say 14, 505. Five. Right. It yeah. depends on where you're measuring high tide or low tide. Yeah. 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 Some of those rocks that you saw. Yeah. So it's, so it's a couple of tall, a little bit taller. <laughs> Did we take in that process this quarter too? I'm in Cal. Cal? Oh, I'm done. <laughs> done. Did you have to take BBQ? No. Okay. Your bio major? Okay. So I don't have to take three. I only have to take the three. Uh, first year Cal. Yeah. Yeah. I was about it. I have my Cal. <laughs> no, it's what, what are you majoring in? Do you know? I don't have a main. I already have a bachelor's degree. Okay. So I'm just going back to school to do my prerequisites for either anesthesia or nursing. And like, I really want to do anesthesia and you can do anesthesia like through nursing, but it takes longer, but you have like kind of a better, more flexible career mm -hmm. or you can just go straight into like this two year anesthesia program, but you can only practice in like a few states. Right. And so that's why I'm like deciding between this course, if I take it like this year or next year. Well, it's a, uh, I clearly like this course, yeah. but, <laughs> but it's not I, like we need a lot of time and a lot of effort. It will, it will be time and effort. Um, but that's going to be the case regardless when you take it. Um, and you're going to get more. So like I mentioned at the beginning, it's the same class regardless of where you take it. It's just a matter of how, what's your class size, what's the support system like where you are, and something we have to consider in Tavo, can you afford to live here while you're also working on being a student? Um, and 
that kind of goes back and forth. Like if you wait to take to take the hard classes till you get to a bigger school, you're going to have less support. Um, but you also might be able to dedicate more of your time to studying things like that. Um, we've had pretty good results here with people who transfer after taking this series and going on and doing pretty well. Um, I mean, you know Rigney? Yep. Rigney Miller? Um, he's, he, I think he just finished his chemistry degree at Berkeley. Wow. Um, and he felt, he took the class with us here the first time we offered it here. Uh, he's, he's a mad scientist. He's a, yeah. <laughs> um, but he, he said that he felt like our, our class here was not lacking as far as he didn't feel behind other people when he got there. He set him up for yeah. success so he, Yeah, he said he set up a lot. I mean, he, he said his own book. Yeah, he did. But um, he would have, he ought to, he would have no, um, he did not be, mind being critical of me if he thought I was not getting the material to the level he wanted it. Um, <laughs> and uh, so I feel pretty good about our, our series here. And well, I won't say it's easier, People, I, we have more people succeed because of the small class sizes and because of all the extra attention, even if it's just as much work as it is, you know, like this is the class where I don't have to fail anybody as long as people are turning stuff in and making it to the end of the class. I get to give everybody a passing grade in this class, which is nice. By the end of the last, the people that finished last series um, was all A's and B's by the end. You just have to be willing to put in the work and know that it's going to come back in terms of um, in terms of grade. Um, so I I highly recommend taking it here um, one way or not this year or next year. But and you're here right now, so if you've got the time, that's what I'm going to say. Sometimes the <laughs> yeah. You have till next Friday to decide too. Oh really? The drop date isn't until next Friday, um, and that's without a record. So that's not, you know, no W or anything like that. Anybody who feels like they're not going to be able to make it the whole time, it's a good idea to get out by next Friday because then it doesn't show up on your record at all. Um, and you get a full refund for any any tuition that you paid. Um, so you get two weeks free trial. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, let's talk a little bit about some quantum review because this is... There, not every aspect of quantum winds up coming back in OCHEM, but there's enough terms that we use and enough ideas when we talk about orbitals and electrons um, that it's worth going back and remembering how this works. So everybody remembers the Bohr model, right? This looks familiar, nucleus in the middle, a bunch of electrons around them taking up space. Um, this is a pretty decent balance, especially when we're talking about individual atoms. Individual atoms, the Bohr model is pretty solid. We can get more specific with it, talking about types of orbitals. Um, is it the 2s versus the 2p? Um, but for the most part, this is not a bad way to think about individual atoms. And one of the other things to remember is the nucleus is both tiny and huge. Nucleus, in terms of size, in terms of volume, the, the analogy that I always um, use is you go to a big league, a major league baseball park and hold a baseball on, on uh, stand on the pitcher's mound holding a baseball. The baseball is the size of the nucleus. The rest of the ballpark is the size of the electrons. So almost everything is, in terms of volume, is the electrons, is the orbitals. But all of the mass is in that baseball. So it's, just to get an idea of this physical, the, the volume size, think about it that way, but then the, the, they're almost inverted as far as the electrons are about 2,000 2, times smaller by mass, even though they take up 2,000 times more space. Um, and so most of what we're going to be talking about in this class is going to be the electrons moving around. So, um, anybody watch Oppenheimer? Anybody having, um, was anybody curious as to how Oppenheimer, you don't hear Oppenheimer's name get mentioned other than being the leader of the Manhattan Project for the most part, right? Everybody knows what Einstein did. Everybody knows what Bohr did. Everybody knows what Heisenberg did and Planck did. Um, Oppenheimer actually 
laid the basis for the way we understand organic reactions um, by making what's called the, the born oppenheimer approximation. Born was his advisor, the one that he left. If you've seen the movie, he left, was at Princeton to go study in Europe, um, in continental Europe, to work with Max Born. Um, and they came up with the born oppenheimer approximation, which basically says because the nucleus is so heavy compared to the electrons, if everything has the same average kinetic energy because it, everything's close to the same temperature, who remembers the physics expression for kinetic energy? What's the equation? One half mv squared. Kinetic energy equals one half mass velocity squared. If mass, if they have the same kinetic energy, but the mass of the nucleus is 2,000 times bigger, the velocity is what? Bigger or smaller? Smaller. It's got to be smaller. By roughly the square root of 2,000 times smaller. Um, what that means is that when we're talking about motion of these atoms, basically that we can treat the nucleus like it's not moving, because it's moving so slow compared to the electrons. <laughs> That's what Oppenheimer did, is he basically allowed it, us to solve the three-body problem by making an approximation by saying, okay, well, yes, the nucleus is there, and technically it's moving, but because it's moving so much slower, we can treat it like it's fixed in space. So it's much like treating electrons like they're reading that thing? Right, or treating, treating the, you know, like a satellite versus the Earth. Um, the satellite pulls on the Earth gravitationally as well, right? But we don't take that into account because the Earth is so much bigger. Electrons are the satellites, and the nucleus is Earth. So we can treat it like the nucleus is fixed in space and just exerting a force on the electrons. Um, and that, that assumption, there's probably a fancy mathematical way to write it, but that idea is actually what won, I don't think Oppenheimer won a Nobel Prize. Um, he must have been close, but he and Born, that was their big contribution to the early days of quantum mechanics which and wound up being a really big deal in my research in grad school because we did computational chemistry. And so we were trying to mathematically solve that three body problem. And we had to basically, you had to treat it like those nuclei were fixed or you can't solve it mathematically. Or I should say humans, humanity does not possess the math necessary to solve that three body problem. Yet. Yet it's possible <laughs> that that math exists and we just don't have it. It's also possible that's a system that doesn't have an anal analytical solution. Um, and that's why math research is still really important because there could be some really interesting things that we could solve better if we were able to do that math. And actually the three body problem, the show on Netflix um, is all about that from an orbital science perspective, three body problem, it's two suns and one planet mm -hmm. and how that affects how the fact that you've got two big gravity sinks around in a planet causes the orbital dynamics to be totally different. But the same math applies to electrons between two nuclei. All right, so um, I mentioned the different types of orbitals before. This is basically like, okay, well, the Bohr model worked pretty well, but then they figured out that there's this other, they call it the ultrafine structure. Um, where, okay, within that N equals two energy level, there are several other different possible energy levels that are all pretty close together in terms of energy. And so the, those are the ones we categorize as being different types of orbitals, and S orbital is roughly spherical. And then P orbital, a P orbital is really made up of three suborbitals where you have these figure eight shapes arranged, and you can kind of think of them as being oriented around um, the three axes in Cartesian space in the three-dimensional graph. You can have the 2PZ means that these, the Z means that these two are arranged along the Z-axis. Then 90 degrees to that, you have the 2PY, where you have the two lobes are arranged around the Y-axis. And then perpendicular to both of those, you have 2PX. 2PX would be arranged along the X-axis. So you have, these are actually probably I switch those labels to keep it following the right-hand rule, um, because you have X, Y, and Z. Z is up and down, right? 
And again, if I look at the, uh, it does still follow the right hand rule because it's in, because they've got the blue here. So the blue is down. Anyway, um, it's because there's a negative sign in there. If you look at the colors of the face there, um, it is still following the right hand rule. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Um, so the rules, who remembers the rules for filling orbitals? We have an orbital energy diagram. <laughs> No two orbitals, or no two. I'm not going to butcher it. <laughs> well, like, is it Hunt's rule where you have to fill each orbital first? Um, so they start at the bottom and work your way up. It's called the off bow principle. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> the off bow principle just says that it literally, in German, it literally means build from the bottom up. Um, the off bow principle, so that just means that if this, if the y axis here is energy, you're going to start by putting electrons at the lowest energy states first. Right? So work from the bottom up. Technically, because the Germans love to just run all their words together, it's off bow principle is the, is the original name. Um, and that's all one word. So, but that literally just means start from the bottom up. So here's an early depiction of what, what they were trying to describe. And in this case, um, energy, the radius from the center um, is instead of having Y axis being the energy, this is really the radius is a function of energy. Um, then Pauli came in Wolfgang Pauli um, said that electrons must have unique quantum numbers. So each orbital can only have two electrons at a time. So, and that's because they, the only reason you can put two of them there is because they have opposite spin. And again, spin is weird because it's not like their charges changed. It's basically, all the different quantum numbers, all the different ways we can explain electrons and identify electron specific electronic states um, are more or less, um, they're kind of like different dimensions, different variables that could be positive or negative. So when you think about electrons being negative, that's one variable. Electrons are negative in the charge variable, but they can also be up or down in the spin variable. They can also be in phase or out of phase. They can be, if I go back to the, they can be in the red or the blue. That's another variable that's not spin and it's not charge. So we try to avoid using positive and negative for it because then it gets confusing because it's like, well, you said positive. Does that mean it's in the red section or the blue section? Or are you talking about spin? Um, we kind of try to not use pluses and minuses, even though mathematically that's exactly what it is, but it's in a different variable than spin, than charge. And right? so they call that the phase of the electrons. But phases can be positive or negative, spin can be positive or negative, charge for an electron is always negative. Um, and the way we keep that all straight is by using different terms for all of those different variables. So instead of saying spin, positive spin or negative spin, we say spin up or spin down. Instead of saying um, positive or negative for, for the phase, we just say it's in phase or out of phase or matching phase or, um, or a counter phase, right? So the one variable that's different between these two, these are two identical electrons with the exception of they have opposite spin. And the reason they call it spin is because you can think of it how if you took a basketball and you spun it with a certain amount of energy, you can put the same amount of energy in to spin it clockwise versus counterclockwise and still get the same total kinetic energy in that ball, right? So it's called spin because there's, two, there's exactly two solutions to that system of equations, one where there's a positive number here and one where there's a negative number, just like a solving for the roots of a parabola that's symmetric, right? 
There's the plus two and the minus two, and they both are equally valid solutions. That's all spin is really, is it's fact, it's the way that square roots work. You wind up with two identical solutions with, an, with a negative, one of them has a negative sign. All right, so we can only put two electrons in here at a time. Hun's rule, that's one you mentioned earlier. Hun's rule was that if you have a bunch of degenerate orbitals, degenerate in chemistry terms just means they're the same energy level, or not the same energy level, they're, they're the exact same energy. If you've got a bunch of degenerate orbitals, you, you basically put one electron into each of them with the same spin before you start doubling up. Turns out if you have unpaired electrons with the same spin in the same, that actually generates a small magnetic field that's actually a favorable energy. That's actually part of what causes magnetism is having these degenerate orbitals with unpaired electrons in them. And if you get a whole system of these where all of them have their, their positive spin pointed in the same spatial direction, you wind up with a material that has an overall magnetic moment to it. Um, they call, that's actually where magnetic materials come from is these unpaired electrons. And it's because Hun's rule is sort of the, the law behind it that explains what happens. Um, and, but the theory that explains that is um, they didn't understand for another, let's see, probably 50 years later in the 50s or 60s um, that they were able to to explain mathematically why that happens. It turns out that matrices are involved in imaginary numbers. Um, so we're not gonna go too far into that because um, upper division math classes aren't a prereq for this class, um, but it does have a mathematical basis why it does that. And things are, it turns out if you are going to have a bunch of degenerate electrons that are unpaired, they're always gonna line up with the same spin first before you start doubling anything up. Um, you may know something about all these different pictures and names. Um, turns out chemistry, and especially organic chemistry, has a fairly white, old, male bias. Um, and it turns out that that's, that's what happens when you allow a very small geographical portion of the world to control the rest of the world for an extended period of time when all of these um, research discoveries are being made. Um, basically, there's no getting around the fact that if you teach chemistry, uh, we don't get, along with ungrading, one of the other big pushes has been to be, to be um, the phrase that gets used is decolonizing the, the curriculum. Try to incorporate diverse viewpoints, stories from others, from other backgrounds that aren't just Northern European or American. Um, that's really hard to do in chemistry because chemistry as a field has only existed since about 1620 until now. And the vast bulk of that time, the military and economic powers all came from the same part of the world, right? Basically, Northern Europe, Western Europe controlled the entire world for the entire life of chemistry so far. Um, so when we talk about the history of chemistry, we, get, we have to talk about a bunch of old, wet, old dead white dudes. Um, and they were not necessarily particularly pleasant people either. So while we can't decolonize the curriculum in chemistry because the curriculum is all discovered by people from Northern Europe, um, we can be realistic about the fact that they were not people to emulate most of these, most of these folks. They were pretty not kind people in a lot of ways. Alfred Nobel. Alfred Nobel. Um, he was known as the merchant of death. Um, Alfred Nobel, the, the reason the Nobel Prize exists is because so Alfred Nobel first synthesized TNT um, and figured out how to make it stable enough that it could be shipped as dynamite, um, which he envisioned being used uh, predominantly for mining and construction. Um, obviously, dynamite has other uses as well and other explosives. Um, and so he was known as the merchant of death, and he didn't know that, actually until there was an explosion in one of his factories in Sweden, Norway, Norway. Um, and his brother was killed in the accident. 
And a newspaper in the UK got the headline and thought it was Alfred Nobel that died. And so they published this big front page obituary of Alfred Nobel, merchant of death dies in fiery blast or something like that. And it was like celebrating that he was dead. Um, and he saw that and he's like, is that really what people think of me? Um, and so he took all of his money and used it to found the Nobel Prize organization. Um, so that's why it's the Nobel Prize, basically because he got this really bad reputation and then wanted to sort of whitewash his reputation or his, his legacy um, at the end of his life. Kind of similar to Bill Gates in a lot of ways. Um, you know, started out and everybody hated him, controlled the market, did a lot of shady things, and now is trying to give away billions of dollars. Um, there's a lot of parallels to be drawn from a lot of the billionaires in our society now to Alfred Nobel's history. Um, Friedrich Wohler was actually, this is, you could say that Friedrich Wohler, he is the one who's the reason organic chemistry, one is called organic chemistry, and two is a field that we even study. Um, because up until the reason organic chemistry has a name organic chemistry is because they thought that all of these compounds could only be made by living things. Um, all of these carbon-based compounds, the conventional knowledge was, well, living things produce carbon-based molecules, but non-living things only produce inorganic compounds. Um, and he accidentally made an organic compound from an inorganic materials. And so he was the one who actually proved that organic chemistry has nothing to do with living things, whether something's living or not. It just has to do with whether something's carbon-based. He accidentally made urea from thiocyanate. Um, he overheated it. He like left it on, on the pot on overnight. Um, and when he came back, it smelled like urine. Um, and he figured out that's because he actually synthesized urea from raw inorganic components. It had nothing to do with anything living. Um, so really groundbreaking. And you'll notice that that was, you know, he lived 1800 to 1882. That was probably in about 1860. So organic chemistry as a field has only been around for less than 150 years. Um, so all things considered, this is actually when we get to get into the science that's actually recent, like really recent. We have a lot of, about a lot of these, um, these people's lives and, and sort of what went into some of these discoveries. Um, August Kikuli, we'll talk about some of the things he did, but basically he came up with the idea that um, electrons move in circles and that like a snake eating its own tail. Anybody heard of an Ouroboros before? Um, it's actually also where we get the symbol for infinity um, because it symbolizes a snake eating its own tail. It comes from ancient Egyptian mythology, um, but he couldn't admit that at the time. When he first came up with this idea to admit that you got an idea from a place like Africa, oh, no, no, please. Um, so he came up with, that came to me in a dream uh, because he wouldn't admit that it actually came from an idea from another culture. Um, so also not a particularly pleasant human. Um, and then you've got stuff like, it turns out a lot of organic chemistry was done in Germany in the early 19, early to mid 1900s. And there were some other things going on in Germany in the early to mid 1900s. Um, we'll talk about the, the uh, Haber process in particular, that basically is a single reason why World War II dragged on for as long as it did. It's the result of a very prominent German nationalist chemist um, named Fritz Haber. So there's all these guys that, that contributed really big ideas that expanded our knowledge of how chemistry works in ways that 100 years before they could never even imagine. Um, but make no mistake about it, they're not necessarily role models. Um, and a lot of their work was, was on the backs of people that never got credit for it. Um, and that were treated as second-class citizens. Some other more positive results I mentioned, we start getting more, more recent stuff and we start getting into people that are a little bit more worthy of uh, um, being called role models, like Marie Curie. Um, she was not an organic chemist, but she is one of the earliest examples of someone who was not an old white dude um, actually participating in science in Northern Europe. Um, Nobody know where she's actually from. She's not actually French. Everybody thinks of her as French. Polish? Yeah, she's Polish. 
She had to leave. So in, in when she was growing up, women were not allowed to go to university in Poland. So she moved to France, where France being the progressive bastion that they were, um, were allowed women to go to university. But even France wouldn't allow women to actually go to grad school or an PhD. Um, so she actually had to find somebody in the um, physics department that would allow her to be a graduate student. She had basically find like a, a sponsor to nominate her to be allowed to do this because even France wouldn't allow women to go to, to grad school. Um, and I, her daughters are actually awesome too. So the Marie Curie won two Nobel Prizes, one in physics, one in chemistry. She shared the one in chemistry with her daughter. So her, one of her daughters had a Nobel Prize as well. Uh, her other daughter is perhaps more badass, uh, was a journalist who opted when the Curies left, um, left France when Germany invaded uh, in World War II. Her younger daughter opted to stay behind in France and wound up fighting for the French resistance um, and then wound up, wound up marrying a man who was one of the earliest administrators of the United Nations post-World War II, um, who won his own Nobel Prize. So poor, I think it was Eve. Um, Eve, mom won a Nobel Prize, dad won a Nobel Prize, sister won a Nobel Prize, husband won a Nobel Prize, poor Eve. Fought in the French resistance, wrote some really important writings in that time, but no Nobel Prize for Eve. Um, some other fun ones. We'll talk at, about Fukui in particular. Fukui is a good example. He did his research. They got him his Nobel Prize roughly 35 years before he won his Nobel Prize because he had the misfortune of doing, of being, not, that's the wrong way to say it. Really. <laughs> uh, yeah, because, because of the fact that he was Japanese and post-World War II, um, the Nobel Committee being made up mostly of Americans and Europeans, didn't think too highly of the Japanese after World War II. Um, so because of that leftover antagonism and racism, um, he actually waited about twice as long as, as um, most Nobel Prize winners have to wait. And he eventually had to share his Nobel Prize with somebody who did the same re research that he did 15 years later, um, who happened to be white and from Northern Europe. So there's a lot of racism baked into the history of chemistry, and we'll talk about some of it. I obviously I really enjoy talking about history of science as well, and we do know a lot about these. And I'm going to try not to make it too whitewashed, um, either culturally or in terms of ignoring all the negatives that these people had, because there was there's a lot of that, um, and it is it does lend. Um, a certain amount of humanity to these people. They're not people up on a pedestal that are perfect. They made some really great strides, really important strides, really smart people that worked really hard, but they also had their faults. Um, does anybody know what uh, Isaac Newton did after he, he had his Anno Mirabilis, his miracle year where he published, where he invented calculus and published his laws of gravitation and motion all in one year. I know he kind of went down no after that, but I don't remember. He was one. essentially a hermit um, who had some signs of, of uh, delusional schizophrenia. Um, he lived in a, in a cottage on Cam Cambridge or I think Cambridge's campus all by himself. And he only come out of his cottage about once a year. Um, and when he did, all he would talk about was numerology and trying to see the face of God in, uh, in the numbers from the Old Testament. Um, so he got he got into Kabbalah. He basically was the first people in Europe to get into Kabbalah, um, and so everybody's like, "Oh boy, Newton's out again." Oh, yeah. yeah, but this is Isaac Newton, right? We invented Newtonian physics is named after this guy. So <laughs> nowadays we call it, we call it um, Nobel disease. When people win a Nobel Prize, they have a tendency to then think that they're an authority on everything, and they sort of they have a tendency to start using their platform to say things that aren't necessarily backed by science. Um, so, just because somebody won a Nobel Prize, though, don't mean you should trust them on any everything. <laughs> if it's outside their area of expertise, still like, pump the brakes on that. Um, there's actually a whole Wikipedia article dedicated to Nobel disease and like 
a list of documented Nobel disease outbursts. Um, that's fascinating reading, going back all the way to the early 1900s. All right, we have five minutes left. So if we're writing out the electron configuration, these are our three most important things. Aufbau principle, Pauli exclusion principle, and Hung's rule. How do we write the electron configuration of carbon? We should start with 1s first. How many electrons does carbon have? Six. Is that right? Six. Six. So start with the 1s. You can hold two electrons, right? One spin up, one spin down. You go to 2s. 2s. Same thing. Same thing. How many electrons left? Two. two. Just two. It look like that. So one of the things, one of my favorite, um, he's not immune to the Nobel disease, but one of my favorite uh, scientists from the from the 20th century uh, was Linus Pauling. Linus Pauling was the one who figured out well that covalent bonds form when you have these half-filled orbitals overlapping with other orbital half-filled orbitals. So that they can both both atoms can have a filled covalence at the same time, right? The word covalent, and I always make a point. It took me. I like etymology and figuring out where words come from. I'm a little bit ashamed to admit that it took like 15 years of taking chemistry classes before I realized where the word covalent comes from. It literally means in both valences at the same time. <laughs> covalent in two valences. Um, and so these covalent bonds were formed when we can have these half-filled orbitals overlapping with other half-filled orbitals. If that's the case, how many elect or how many bonds should carbon make? Wait, how many half-filled orbitals does it have? Oh, if true. this is yeah. the true story, if this is the full story, then carbon should only make two bonds, and they should be at ninety degrees to each other. But that's not what we actually saw. So what they figured out is that, well, we actually see carbon making four bonds and they're 109 degrees from each other. Before they understood this, they, they were still able to start figuring out these molecular geometries um, before they understood why they had the shape they did. Because um, basically the experimental side was progressing at the same rate as the theory side. So they were able to sort of go back and forth. The theoreticians would say one thing, and then the experimentalists would say, well, that's not what we see. And then the theoreticians would have to go back and adjust their theory. Um, so the scientific process, right? And so Linus Pauling, who up until last year was the only other person besides Marie Curie to win two Nobel Prizes. Linus Pauling won two Nobel Prizes in one in chemistry and he won a Nobel Peace Prize for his work on nuclear disarmament in the 60s. Um, big time hippie, he lived, the second half of his life, he lived in Big Sur with when all of the folk rockers from, um, from that time period all moved up to Big Sur. So he got to hang out with Neil Young um, and worked a ton on nuclear disarmament. And so he won a Nobel Peace Prize in addition to winning a Nobel Prize for research. Um, he's the only one who's done that. The other two people that have won two Nobel Prizes, and both of them were for research. Fury and then a guy named uh, Sharpless um, just got a second Nobel Prize last year. And he's he's still alive and still doing research in uh, Southern California. He works at Scripps Institute. Um, I have a personal connection to that because his reaction, one of the reaction he eventually won his second Nobel Prize for was the reaction that I spent four years studying in grad school. So when that happened, what Sharpless got a Nobel, another Nobel Prize? Um, it was a big deal in our household, at least for me. All right, so what must be going on if carbon makes four bonds, but it only has two half the orbitals? Hybridization. Turns out it, making bonds is really energetically favorable because it allows us to fill this entire energy level instead of just filling these two chunks of it. So what happens when you hybridize something is you basically, each of these is just is a mathematical function that represents where you're likely to find the electrons. Well, the thing about the mathematical functions is you can mix mathematical functions together to get sort of a weighted average of the two. And so hybridization is literally just taking 
one part S and three parts P to make these four hybrid orbitals that look like a combination of the two. And mathematically, they're a combination of the two. Um, it'll be like 0 0.25 times the 2S orbital function plus 0 0.25 times the 2PX function. You literally mix them together with different weights here. And what that does is it evens out these energy levels so that instead of having a 2S and a, and a 2P, if we're going to start making bonds, it's more, it's to a larger advantage to be able to make enough bonds to fill the entire energy level. And so by doing this, where did I have? It allows us to take 2S and 2P to make these four orbitals that are all in between those two energy levels. It'll be 75% of the way up here. So basically, if, if this is drawn to scale, these should be right up here, where you've got 75% of the, this is brought up and these are brought down 25%. Because we're mixing these two energies together. If you have three parts of this energy and one part of that energy, you're going to get something that's 0.75 of the way across, right? You take the average of them. Um, the result, the actual result is a little bit trickier than that because we have other things there, the variables going on. But at a real basic level, that's literally all we're doing is taking these three functions, these four functions, and adding them together to make a total of four. SP3 orbitals. And all of a sudden, when you do that, if you take those P orbitals and the S orbitals, you mix them together, you put negative signs in the right spot, they all have to be linearly independent functions, but we can mix them together with however we want to, and that, that actually generates naturally a tetrahedral shape. Because these are all four of these are three dimensional functions that have a certain shape to them. And when you mix those shapes together, you get something different. You get constructive interference in some places, destructive inter place, interference in other places. And that creates something that's tetrahedral. It's got that 109.5 degrees between the different bonds. Um, and then you can do that. So it is it's pure geometry, the way it's all mixed together. Um, when you start with those functions, if you literally draw them and then you cancel out, you erase where there's destructive interference and you make things bigger where there's constructive interference, you get four orbitals that look, they're sort of kind of, Um, they're still kind of figure eights, but they're figure eights where one side is way bigger than the other. You can think of blowing up a party balloon and how like the little bit that's left over when you tie the knot is, left, is really small. You can think of that as the other side of the figure eight. You basically took the figure eight and you blow up this side and, and you cancel out part of that side to get something that looks like that. You take four of those you take four balloons and hold them all by the knot in one hand, what shape do you get? And they're all naturally pushing each other apart as much as they can. What's the furthest apart you could put four objects in three dimensions? 109.5 degrees from each other. So these naturally arrange themselves in a tetrahedral shape, which is why carbons that have four bonds or any element that has four electron groups around that central atom is going to make a tetrahedral shape, right? It all comes back to that those rules of, of um, quantum mechanics that hopefully after today make a little bit more sense than they did the first time you saw them. Seeing things the second time is always helpful, right? All right. <laughs> Uh, we'll go ahead and stop there.